I want to jump in right away to the Word of God today. So if you have your Bibles, if you could open them up to Matthew 22, and then as well, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 6. So two places, I know it's a little hard, not that hard, but Matthew 22 and then Deuteronomy 6, we're going to be jumping into the Word of God tonight. Matthew 22, verse 34, it says this, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. Now, if you've grown up around church, you've probably heard this verse before. You've probably been in messages and sermons where the pastors talked about this. But what we see in this verse is this is God's definition of success. This is God talking about what it looks like for humanity to live a successful life. Jesus is asked, what is the most important thing for humanity to do? In another a gospel, the, the, the question is asked, what is the most important commandment in all the law, in all the Old Testament? Right, And Jesus comes back and he says it's right here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Now it's powerful for us to get this principle, for us to live it, but I think there's something a little bit deeper in this command if we dig into the scripture and the context for what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus didn't just come up with this command. He didn't just make it up on the fly. He was actually quoting from a passage in the Old Testament that we're going to be unpacking today that I believe is profoundly significant for the hour we live in in this next generation. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to be reading in verses 4. Uh, through nine. You can follow along with me. And in Deuteronomy six, it says this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And then verse six, this is the context that we see this passage in. It says, in these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What we see in this passage is this, is that God entrusted the greatest commandment. God entrusted the teaching of success for humanity to parents and to family. It's not just go to the temple, but go to the home. It's not just go to the priest, it's go to a parent. It's not just hear about these things on Sabbath. It is learn them every day. And today I want to talk to you about that God ordained the home to be a source of authority and godly truth and righteousness. Today I want to talk about that the DNA for revival isn't just found in a pastor, but it's found in a parent. And actually, I have a theory that in the next 20 years, home discipleship will become the primary method of reaching the next generation. In a world tired of manipulative marketing schemes, crooked political platforms, and out-of-touch conspiracy theories, the authenticity of family discipleship will build up a generation in the church and draw in a generation outside the church. And the title of my message today, if you're taking notes, is this. It's Passing the Torch. And for this, these next minutes, I'm going to share on how the church needs to reframe our strategy to reach this next generation and how God is raising up homes as altars of prayer and discipleship to set the stage for a new move of God in our generation. I want to pray as we jump in today. But Lord, we love you. We thank you, God. I just thank you for this opportunity, this privilege to share today. And I ask for everyone listening, God, give us hearts to receive your word. Lord, I ask for every home, every family, God, every empty nester in a season of looking into life without kids, for every student, every teenager, every single mom, Lord, that we would get this idea that you are moving in our homes, that you are moving in this next generation, God. I ask for a blessing on families, that we would experience the goodness and the power of Jesus in our home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
And um, speaking of family, I um, would love just to honor Pastor Lee today. Uh, some of you know, but Pastor Lee, he's my pastor. Um, he's my boss. He's my favorite teacher, but he's also my father-in-law. So I'll get the whole, whole package in there. I married Pastor Lee's oldest daughter, Ashley. We met in Colorado Springs, Colorado in an internship in 2012. And since then, it's been a privilege of mine to get to receive from Pastor Lee as, again, an amazing communicator, but also as a father in my life. And in one thing I just want to brag on Pastor Lee in, in is this, is that he is a man of integrity on and off the stage. That has moved my heart more than a teaching, more than a message, even though, again, he's impacted me so much in those ways, but the way that he is the same man of God and walks with the same integrity on and off the platform has done something to me. And I'm just so grateful for who he is as a father in my life, as a pastor of this church. Let's just give it up for him, honor him today. And a little bit about my story. Again, I met my wife, Ashley, 2012 in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We dated out there for a few years. And then we moved out here in 2015. Um, we got married in June. We're coming up on our sixth anniversary, anniversary. And since then, we've been investing. We've had the privilege to invest and to serve into the next generation in Radiant Students. And over these five years, we've seen God do a lot of really cool stuff. But even in this moment, I just want to highlight some of the things that God is doing in our students. I I see some of them here today. Uh, what's up? My students coming out here. Uh, give me some love. Y'all are awesome. But seriously, guys, God is doing something in this next generation. I know Pastor Lee shared on it a few weeks ago, guys, but every Monday night, nearly 75 junior high and senior high students are paying money to come in, pray for an hour, and then hear discipleship teaching for an hour, and then break into small groups. Like, guys, we have prayer meetings where they're jumping up and down, and they're shaking the floor in our downtown prayer center. And, you know, I'm texting uh, our, our uh, uh, downtown manager, Randy Sims. I'm like, hey, did you guys install that new uh, beam on the floor? I'm like, this is going to end up going viral if we crush a, a building with a bunch of youth kids. But... um. <laughs> But God is doing something on these Monday nights. Disciples are being formed, even in our downtown prayer room. I mean, I feel like I'm yelling at a kid every other day because they're skipping school to go to a prayer meeting. I'm sorry, teachers. Um, but I'm like, hey, if you're going to skip school for anything, come to a prayer meeting. Even this weekend, we have 24 students that are getting baptized. 24 young people that are getting baptized, making a decision to follow Jesus. This year, we've had 15 salvations in Radiant students. We had a junior high retreat where the power of God broke out. We're, we're, get this, guys. Again, we talk about anxiety and depression in a generation. How many of you guys know God's joy and God's peace is stronger than anxiety and depression? And we are seeing the power of God break out. Students saving up money, buying nice Bibles. Like, that's like, again, they're, they're making fun of each other. Like, you only have a fake leather Bible? And like, check out my calfskin over here. But it's just amazing seeing what God is doing. And even for me as a student pastor, I'm at a point where um, it's a really fun stage where I'm getting to start doing weddings for students that I pastored over the years. And even um, in a few months, I get the privilege, the opportunity. I'm marrying uh, one of our students. She came to Radiant Students for the first time unsaved from a broken family, encountered the presence of God on a youth retreat. And since then... She's a leader in our youth group. She's currently at Bible college studying to become a pastor and a preacher in this next generation. She has a godly engagement, godly man of God she's getting married to, and she is setting out into life as a resilient disciple. She's encountered the presence of God. She, they're establishing a foundation in their home. It's just such a powerful opportunity um, that we have, again, seeing God move in this next generation. And I'm so grateful. I just want to say I'm so grateful to all of you. Parents, thank you. Thank you for believing in myself and Pastor Preston. Thank you for believing in our kids team. Thank you for investing into us. Students, thank you. Thank you for coming when we put on an event. That's seriously, I feel like I plan events. I'm just like praying that kids show up and they, they come. Thank you, students, for coming. It's lots of fun. Um, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to get to invest into this next generation. And I'm so grateful for what God is doing. But tonight, I want to talk a little bit about, yes, I'm so grateful for what God is doing in our midst, but there's a reality that we are in a tipping point for a generation. And I want to activate this a little bit and visualize this a little bit. I'm going to need you guys to help me out with this. But if your birthday 
is from January 1st through August 31st. I want you to stand up. If your birthday is from January 1st through August 31st, I want you to stand up. Look around the room. This is roughly 66% of the room, give or take. Right now, 2021, 66% of young people are losing their faith the year after they graduate high school. This isn't a small thing. This isn't just a statistic. Look around. This is two-thirds of the room. And today, I want to talk about what we need to do to reshift our thinking. You can be seated. For the first time in 80 years, church-attending Christians are in the minority in the United States. And in the last great uh, kind of world conflict, World War II, um, generals and uh, military strategists, they would look at combat. They would make plans, and even the D-Day invasions, they would create plans and strategies about uh, going into battle. And in those plans, they would create casualty acceptable rates. For most World War II strategists, they said between 10 and 30% casualty rate. That's an acceptable loss rate in battle. As a church, we're losing 66%. And if that's the rate that they decided is acceptable for a normal conflict, how much more in a spiritual conflict do we need to feel the weight of what we are facing? That we are in a war for a generation and the enemy is raging. And tonight, I just want you to know, I'm not here to complain about losing like a place of cultural relevancy. I'm not complaining about, hey, we don't have like the cultural majority anymore as uh, evangelicals. That's not what I'm doing. I am here today saying that we are losing souls. We are losing souls. And this is the gospel. This is what we witnessed a second ago, is that Jesus Christ came and died on a cross for you and for me, so that even though we didn't deserve it, Right, Even though you and me, we did not deserve it, that, that his righteousness would be imputed to us and we would receive life. This is the good news. This is what we celebrated, right? Is that they are going down into the water, identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. As the community of God, we have a mission to preach the gospel to a nation. And right now, we need to step it up. We need to rethink what we are doing because the reality is, again, 66%. 66%. And guys, this is the thing that keeps me up at night. This is the thing that puts me on a face. It puts me on my face in a prayer meeting. 66%. We need to do something different. And the truth is, more than us even needing to do it because we need to survive. We need to do it because Jesus commanded it. The Great Commission is not a great suggestion. When we talk about unreached people groups, Gen Z in the United States is growing as one of the largest unreached people groups on the planet today. We live in a post-Christian world, and the time is ripe to see God break into a new generation. But I just want to say there's hope today. Yeah, the 66%, it's heavy, it's difficult, but there is hope today. In a, a recent interview, David Kinneman, he's the director of Barna Research Group. They're a leading poll organization for uh, Christianity, for a biblical worldview in the United States. He was uh, on an interview, and he was talking about the 66% number, and, and in the interview, he said, yeah, our generation is at a tipping point. Our generation is at a tipping point for a biblical worldview, for, for even the, the gospel to go forth. He says, unless two things happen, unless two things happen. The first is, he says, we need to see a move of God. One thing I so respect of 
Pastor Lee, of Pastor Caleb, the, the team here, is that there is a heart and a burden to see a move of God here at Radiant Church. And even as a young person, as a millennial, I'm 27 years old, there is something about seeing the next generation cry out for a move of God that just gets me so excited. I'm so grateful to be a part of a house that cries out for a move of God. Because even the thing is, crying out for a move of God, it's not just some new hype. It's not a new fad. We have a history of revival in this country. I don't know if you knew that. We see the first great awakening, the second great awakening, the Jesus people movement. There has been back through history in our nation times and seasons where just like today, we see the, the, the biblical worldview and church attendance dropping. We see uh, the, the people begin to walk away from the Lord. But what we see in these seasons is that sovereignly in a moment, God steps in to history as God, uh, as God's people begin to pray. He responds and brings salvation, brings power, brings a cultural shift in a time and a season. And we we see it over and over again in history. Even David Kinnaman in this interview, he's like looking at the numbers. He's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried. He's like, we've been worse than this. And God has stepped in and brought revival. There is hope for America. There is hope for a move of God in this next generation. But the second thing that David said really has been just alive in me and I believe is so important for us today. And, and that is this. He's like, we need to see a move of God. But with that, we need to see a radical re-emphasis of family discipleship. And he breaks it down and he says the difference today versus, say, 50, 100, 150 years ago is we live in a time where the family unit is under attack. We live in a time where Families and homes, no matter what your family looks like, have, uh, they, we have not grasped the responsibility that we have to bring up disciples, not just in the four walls of the church, but in the four walls of our home. To, to make disciples, not just at the altars, but at our dinner tables. And I've heard it said, the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing and expecting different results. And I think as we look, the 66%, we look at even cries for reformation, cries for revival, we need to reframe our approach as we invest into this next generation. And that's what I want to dig into for the rest of our time today. Is this is in light of the critical times we're seeing in the world around us, we need to reframe how we're discipling the next generation generation. And the first way we need to do this is in the church. And the church needs to return to its multi-generational mission. Psalm 145 verse 4 says, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Every one of us is here today because of the faithfulness of a prior generation to preach the gospel to us. When I was in uh, third grade, um, in 2002, uh, again, I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and uh, I remember so clearly uh, the 2002 Olympics. Anybody remember that? The, the Salt Lake City Olympics right after 9-11. My parents bought um, a cable for the first time. Again, I grew up. I just remember. We didn't have cable before that, and then we got cable and watched a whole lot of Animal Planet, Crocodile Hunter. This is, yeah, guys, Crocodile Hunter, I feel like he's like the... the the guy for a generation. Like millennials, like I think that's a test of, a, of if you're a millennial or not, if you know who the crocodile hunter is. But, um, but uh, I remember 2002 uh, for the uh, Olympic Games right in Salt Lake City and where they do this thing in the Olympics each year where they have the Olympic torch. How many of you guys are familiar with the Olympic torch? For, for what happens is, is in Olympia, uh, Greece, they light this torch up, right? It's like where the first Olympic Games were held all the way back when, but they light this torch up and then runners relay the torch to all these other Olympic cities around the world. And, and for us, it just so happened that in Colorado Springs, um, the Olympic torch runner was going to run through our city. So I remember it uh, really clearly. It was like really cold. There was a winter Olympics. So we all got out and, you know, I was so excited. Like as a third grader, I'm like, it's going to be amazing. I'm like, how big is this torch going to be? And I'm, I'm picturing some guy that's like on fire running through the crowd. Um, you know how it is. Like, again, it's just been hyped up by like all the adults. So I was super excited. It was cold. And, um, you know, so I remember being out in the street and I remember seeing this guy running down the street, carrying the torch. 
in, he wasn't on fire, which I was a little disappointed um, in. But um, I just remember thinking as I watched the torch, how crazy it was that that torch had been passed from runner to runner to runner, from city to city to city, from nation to nation to nation. Um, I remember as a third grader trying to figure out how they ran across the ocean, but um, whatever. But um, this is the fact that that torch had been carried across the world for such a time as this. And what we see in our faith today is that Jesus took fire from heaven, took the torch from the Father. In, in John, it says, only the Son of Man has seen the Father. And what we see is that Jesus came with the good news of the gospel, that we did not have to earn our way to God, but he was coming to us for salvation, for freedom, for healing, that Jesus came and he brought fire from heaven. And since that moment, from generation to generation, from disciple to disciple, the torch of the gospel has been passed. It's so cool thinking about it. Like, just right now, I want you to think back to whoever first introduced you to the faith. Maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a pastor, a relative. And now, I want you to think back, who introduced them to the faith? And so on, and so on, and so on. Guys, we are standing today on a legacy of 2,000 years of gospel proclamation from generation to generation. And today, as we look at the next generation, we have to see it's our responsibility to pass the torch. So what this looks like for us today, it's really simple. Find somebody younger than you and disciple them. And even though it's simple, current statistics say that only 17% of the church is discipling someone younger than them. It's not complicated. If we want to see the gospel move to the next generation, it stands to reason we got to disciple young people. And I want to say today, it is not just my job to disciple young people. It is not just my responsibility. It is not just parents' responsibility to disciple young people. If we want to see young people discipled in the body of Christ, every single one of us has to get this. And that doesn't mean you have to be discipling kids or teenagers, but boomers, disciple Xers. Right? If you're 60, 70 years old in here, guess what? Find a 50-year-old and disciple them. 50-year-olds, find a 30-year-old and disciple them. Maybe you're an empty nester. Find some young parents and disciple them in uh, raising kids. And I just want to say today, for specifically Generation X, again, I don't know the years, but I don't know. Generation X. Millennials and Gen Z are so desperate for mothers and fathers in their life. So desperate. We live in a world where broken families, broken marriages, broken parents is everywhere. We need you. We need you. This isn't like a suggestion, but I want to challenge you in here today. If you're watching online, I want to challenge you. Who are you discipling that's younger than you? Who are you discipling? Again, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be like this super spiritual, amazing person. Have someone younger over to your house and talk to them about life. Talk to them about following Jesus. Challenge them. Give them some of your wisdom. We need to be a multi-generational body of Christ if we want to see God move in this next generation. Next thing we can do, my shameless plug is the student's pastor, serve in kids and in youth. And I just know what some of you guys are thinking right now. You're thinking, Zach, I don't like kids. <laughs> and I just want to say to you, that's fine. Actually, the disciples thought the same thing. Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 14 says, And they were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Jesus has a passion for kids. 
Jesus has a passion for the next generation. We're not babysitting. We're not hanging out. We're not trying to make your life more comfortable in here. We are committed to making disciples in this next generation. And not all of you, but some of you need to take up the call to serve this next generation. This is a quick testimony that moves my heart just so much as I even think back to it. But a few uh, weeks ago, Pastor Caleb talked about being family-oriented. And he talked about how every single one of us has giftings and has abilities that we need to share with the body. And uh, after the service, a, uh, a woman came up to me, and she is uh, an amazing counselor in our city. She uh, is gifted, she's educated, and she comes up to me in tears uh, in her eyes. And she just says that she's like, I've been using my gifting for my clients, but not kids in my own church. She's like, what do you need? What do you need? We got her plugged in. She's discipling students. She's in our Monday night group. She's discipling young people in a couple weeks. Like, and for me, oh, it's amazing. I'm like, we have amazing, amazing people. Here. Some of you have amazing giftings, passions. How are you investing that into the next generation? My next point is this. Student ministry needs to become a discipleship machine, not an attractional event. When I first moved here to uh, Richland in Michigan, again, I grew up in Colorado. We did not have fields. Again, some of you know this if you've been to Colorado, but Colorado is a desert. There is no water. There's like some streams up in the mountains, but if you get off the mountains, it is dry. So again, I got out here, and, and one thing I love each year, and maybe it's quaint, I don't know, but I love seeing like the corn get planted, it grow up, it get harvested. It's this really cool, again, I don't know, this like watching the season change uh, in the cornfield. Um, but I want you to imagine for a second that you're a farmer, right? And you're planting seeds, you're sowing seed. And seeds start coming up, right? You look at the field, there's seeds popping up, there's all these green sprouts, and you're like, wow, look at that, I got a harvest. And then a month later, two-thirds of those little seedlings die. Because what that is, that's a picture of youth ministry in the United States right now. We are celebrating butts and seats at an event that walk away from the faith their first year after high school. We've celebrated the fruit of getting people in the door, but not the true fruit that abides. Student ministry, kids ministry. It's not child care. It's not behavior management. It's not entertainment. It's not a social club. It's not a spot for them to find friends. It's not a church amenity to get families in the door and be uh, comfortable. It's not a church growth strategy. Students and kids ministry is a kingdom growth strategy. A 2019 study shows that two-thirds of Christians accept Christ before the age of 18. Next-gen ministry is the most strategic time to make disciples. We say our mission statement as Radiant Church is to make disciples. This is the most strategic time to do that. And right now, in this very moment, we have our incredible kids team. They are watching your kids. They're not babysitting. They're making disciples. They're not babysitting. We are forming young people into the image of Christ, brick by brick, lesson by lesson. This is what it has to be about. And even in our student ministry, guys, this is our why. We exist to make resilient disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ that will leave high school and will carry the torch of revival and prayer to their college campuses. It's not the ones that go to college and get burned out, but the ones that go and start a prayer meeting, that begin leading their friends to the Lord. This is my heart. This is my passion, that I could get a junior high kid in sixth grade, and they would have an encounter with Jesus as a 12-year-old. So they'd be leading school prayer as a 16-year-old, so they'd be leading a move of God on their campus as a 21-year-old. This is our heart. This is our pipeline. We exist to make resilient disciples, and I'm passionate about this because I'm a product of a youth ministry that didn't just play around with games. Pastor David Perkins, and I just want to honor him, He's the, currently the senior pastor of Radiant Kansas City, but he was my student pastor along with uh, Pastor Preston. He was our youth pastor growing up. And, and what's crazy, again, we, we grew up in a cool time in youth ministry, giant conferences, 10,000 kids in a room. Our youth group at a time had 1,000 kids on a weekly basis. But those weren't the things that got me. What gripped my life, what changed my life for Jesus was sitting alone in a prayer room 
that they created, my youth group created a 24-7 prayer room. It had red walls. It was kind of creepy. Um, was sitting alone in a prayer room and encountering Jesus. It wasn't the hype. It wasn't the pizza. It wasn't the games. It wasn't playing chubby bunny. It wasn't popping, popping balloons with my butt. It was encountering Jesus in a prayer room. We exist to make resilient disciples who have encountered the presence of God. This is what we're about. This is our heart. This is what we want to see happen here at Radiant Church. So what that looks like for us today, parents, send your kids to a camp or retreat. Send your kids to a camp or retreat. The most strategic thing you can do for your child's spiritual development, send them to a camp or retreat. I don't know why. God shows up at camps in retreat. I'm here today because God met me as a 12-year-old at a fall retreat. Second thing, give your kids permission to take a gap year, please. All my seniors are going to start shouting me out in a second. Um, parents, I'm going to level with you. Do you really want to send, spend thousands of dollars to watch your kid change his major five times and lose his faith? So the reality is some parents are more concerned about their kids' sports scholarships than their eternal salvation. Don't get me wrong. I was a two-sport varsity athlete. I was in five practices a week, nine months of the year. But I would shower in a sink so I could make it to youth group every week. I'm not saying don't do sports. But I'm saying what is the value of your home? What's the priority of your home? Students, give me a year. Come to everything. I promise God will change your life. You can find out more information for what we're doing on our website. Last point is this. Is our families need to become altars of prayer and worship. If we want to see God move in our next generation, we need our families to become altars of prayer and worship. We see it in Deuteronomy 6. God entrusted the greatest commandment, not to a pastor, but to families, to homes. It's not my job to disciple your kids. I can pastor them. I can't disciple all of them. We have a job to disciple our families. Charles Spurgeon, prince of preachers, said this. He said, we deeply want a revival of domestic religion. The Christian family was the bulwark of godliness in the days of the Puritans. But in these evil times, hundreds of families of so-called Christians have no family worship, no restraint upon growing sons, no wholesome instruction or discipline. How can we hope to see the kingdom of our Lord advance when his own disciples do not teach the gospel to their own sons and daughters? That one stings a little bit. It stings for me a little bit. Even for me and... My wife, we have a two-year-old son, and this is something that we've been wrestling with. We've been praying with. We've been asking, God, give us a vision. How do we disciple our son? How can we have our home, our family, be a place of discipleship? And I just want to say really fast, this isn't just for parents, but for all of us, college students, that you live with some roommates. How can your flat be an altar of discipleship? Empty nesters, how can your home be a home of discipleship? A book I'd recommend for is everyone. It's really speaking to me right now. Spiritually Vibrant Homes by Don Everts. It talks about things that they look at the Christians that aren't following, falling away after high school. It looks at some things that they're practicing in their homes, spiritually vibrant homes. So a few things really fast that we can do. Set everyday rhythms, prayer, worship, and spiritual formation. I love, guys, that 8 a.m. prayer meeting. You know, in some days, it's on, and, and I'm just trying to survive because my two-year-old's hitting me with something, and I don't even know what's going on. But it's on. 
it's on. Have rhythms of prayer in your home. I love even Pastor Lee's testimony where today he loves the word of God, knows more about the word of God than almost anyone I know. Where did he develop that love for the word of God? Sitting on his grandfather's lap every morning. As his grandpa read the Bible to him. And today, my son benefits from that decision 60 years ago. My kid's gonna grow up loving the Bible because a man chose to disciple his grandson in his house. Invest intentional time, build relationships and trusting. And it's not complicated stuff, but parents, I just wanna charge you today. It's time to step up and lead your home. It's time to get vision for how are you discipling your family. For all of us, if you have kids, if you don't have kids, it is time for us to step up and get a vision for how Jesus is going to move, not just when you show up at church on a weekend, but on the rest of the days, on the Monday morning, on the Tuesday afternoon. How is God breaking in to your, your home? And, and the truth is, and I get this, is even talking about families, the reality is, is that families so often are, are some of the most broken and play, uh, broken in difficult places in our life. It's betrayal, divorce, abuse, whatever it is. Again, I get it. Families are messy. But how many of you know Jesus didn't die on a cross just so you could get some good feelings on a Sunday morning? He came to transform your family. He came to bring healing and restoration to the, the deepest and sometimes the most vulnerable, broken places in our life. God doesn't just want to break in at a service. He wants to break in at a dinner table. If you'd stand with me as we finish this time today. Parents, if you have your kids, bring them close. Spouses, if you want to hold hands, I don't know. Just bring your family together, whatever that looks like. Roommates, y'all can do your thing, I don't know. I believe this. God is restoring families as a new wineskin to contain a third great awakening in our country. If we want to see God move in a generation, we need to commit to make disciples in the church, in our student ministries, and in our homes. That our homes would be not just self-focused places where we go and, you know, eat uh, pizza and watch Netflix, but our, ho our homes would be strategic environments of prayer and discipleship. That our homes, our families would be altars of worship and prayer. Even young people, single people in this room, have you prayed to ask God to give you vision? for your future family, for your future home. You know, we pray and say, God, give me, give me vision for my career. When was the last time you said, God, give me vision for my home? Give me vision for my home. We're standing at a crossroads moment in this generation, 66%. But today I believe, I believe if God's people stand up and do what we've been doing for the past 2,000 years, we're gonna see a move of God in this next generation. So I want to pray for us, and I want to bless us again just right now. Let's just pray for our families. Pray for the people next to you as, as we close today. But Father, we say, Lord, that we need you. God, we need you in our homes. We need you in our families. God, we need you in this next generation. And right now, Holy Spirit, we ask that the river of God would flow into every home into every home, the presence, the power, the healing, and the restoration of Jesus, the healing that Jesus, you won on the cross, would flow into our families, into our prodigal relationships, into our homes. God, that every home would be an altar, that every dinner table would be a place of discipleship, that your kingdom would come and break in, not just in our services, God, but in our families. Lord, we lift up this next generation and we ask, Holy Spirit, send revival. Send revival. We need to see a move of God in this next generation. Lord, would you stir up your people to see the harvest in Gen Z? Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.